Let's say we're live. Wednesday, Thursday, lab. Don't forget your allelopathy leachates. We'll get those set up. Exams next Friday. Here, 8 a.m. Try to get here a little bit early. You can start as soon as I get here. Anything else? Quiz, right? We got quizzes to probably have another quiz that goes live after today, uh, after day, today's class, and then probably one more before our exam. Uh, just remember, if you didn't, if you didn't take the quizzes or still have attempts remaining, uh, you can take those attempts until uh, Monday, eleven thirty. So at eleven thirty at night, quizzes go away; they disappear. That gives you access to all the keys that you have. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday to prep for the exam. I would say definitely prep for. Uh, we start at. Where do we start? At? Population. I think is where we start. Um, yep. Yeah. Demography defining population. That's where our exam starts. It. Uh, the lab will include, I'll have to double check the labs, but it was uh, life tables, not the biodiversity, what do we do? Uh, spatial dispersion, so spatial dispersion and, and associations, life tables, and stuff we're doing today, or this week, community similarity. It's on our exam. Any questions? How's the uh, population growth equations going? Yeah. All right. This is where we left off. To finish this up, I just want to quick give a quick summary uh, to talk about life histories, because that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to hit each of the components of, of the, the major components of a life history strategy. So these strategies are the suite of characteristics that define how, how an organism grows and reproduces. All right, we have to remember that the suite of strategy is under selection. So while we would typically think of selection acting on a single phenotype or a single trait, here we're actually acting on the entire strategy itself because we have a bunch of trade-offs happening with our strategies. If we do one thing, it's at the cost of another thing and so forth. So selection can't really just pick one item and favor one item. It has to look at the overall goal. All right. So things that are going to affect the evolution of our strategy is environmental variability. That should kind of be, be known. I mean, you should know that by now because we talked about fitness and the properties of fitness. What are the properties of fitness, by the way? Good review for the final. Three properties of fitness. What are they? Go back and look it up. What are the three properties of fitness? Who has found it? Ian, did you find it? 
three properties of fitness. I'll give you one. We measure fitness over more than one generation. It's a property of the genotype, right? So if you have the same genotypes, you have the same fitness. And it's a property of the environment. If the environment changes, so does our phenotype. So environmental variability, it's not just what are the environment. So two different populations of the same species could have two different life history strategies because they're in different environments, all right? And the environments affect the fitness. But also, we have to consider the variability itself. Is it a constant type of, of variation where we see little, little variation over time? Or is it a unpredictable and rapid changes? Because that determines whether or not we're going to favor genetic adaptation or phenotypic plasticity. That's that point down there. The selection forces are really tied to our mortality factors. So what's our risk of dying? If we're more likely to die early on in life, then it's probably best to go ahead and try to reproduce before you get, get nailed, before, you, before natural selection or nature takes you out. All right? If you've got situations where your mortality risk isn't very high until you get to later in life, then it's probably best to invest our energy into growing and into uh, getting bigger and trying to acquire, uh, acquire better nutrients and better resources so that when we do reproduce, we're giving our offspring the best chance. That's, it's all tied to our mortality factors. All right, these life history strategies, series of trade-offs, and it's tied to our uh, finite amounts of energy. So we have to allocate energy to growth, reproductive, reproduction, and maintenance. And if we allocate it one way, that means that energy is unavailable to everything else. But it's not just allocation to each of these three major processes. Each process has its own set of trade-offs. So when we talk about growth, should we grow bigger or should we grow faster? In some cases, those two things are, are a little bit different. For reproduction, should we, should we have a lot of offspring or should we have fewer offspring but now invest in more in parental care and so forth? And then all of this, this strategy, our fitness is determined by the reproductive value. How valuable are we to the population? These curves are triangular and shaped. And what matters isn't necessarily the peak of that curve, but rather the total area under that curve. So if we're comparing two different strategies, what we need to do is look at the area under the curve. That curve that has the most area has a higher fitness, and thus selection should favor that life history strategy. All right, questions? Quick review. So now, what we're going to talk about are the different components. And we're going to start with life cycles. <clears throat> All right, we're going to start with our life cycles. So the life cycle is how you grow and develop. That's really what we're talking about. How do we grow and develop? And we can grow in a direct life cycle, or we can grow as a complex life cycle. And this is growth from an embryo to the adult stage. Yep. We'll, we'll talk about each of these simple and complex uh, ones in a bit. So we've got simple versus complex life cycle. That's one difference. Second difference is, do we have a resting stage in our life cycle? Is there going to be some point in our life where we just shut down and wait? Wait until some cue, and once that cue is received, then we start developing and growing again. So we define this resting stage as a developmental stage in which our organism is dormant, inactive, and often resistant to harsh environmental conditions. We've seen this before. Right? This is one of our avoidance strategies. When conditions turn bad, we can have a go into a resting stage, we can shut ourselves down, and then just wait it out. Wait out the bad conditions. So oftentimes the resting stage, the presence of a resting stage in a life cycle is tied to that environmental variability. 
And then the third aspect of our life cycle is development and constancy of an organism sex. So this would be for our dioecious organism, where we need both male and female, and they get together and they mate to produce their offspring. Once we become one sex, or once we, if we are genetically one sex, do we stay that? Or do, do we switch at some point in time? So those are the three features of our life cycles that we're going to talk about. We're going to start with our development of the individual. Ready? All right, so development. We can have a simple life cycle or a complex life cycle. And this really kind of breaks it down between a direct life cycle and an indirect life cycle. So with a simple life cycle, we go from our egg embryo juvenile to the adult. And our juvenile is basically a mini miniature adult. In the sense that when we see the juvenile, our adult's going to look very, very similar to it. In these simple life cycles, sex is genetically determined. So whenever fertilization happens, Whatever the genetic code says we're going to be, that's, that's, what we'll, that's what we'll be. Now, we can kind of ignore uh, genetic abnormalities. We can ignore those and just talk about if everything goes right, sex is genetically determined. All right, so egg to juvenile to the adult. The juveniles basically looks the same as the adult. All right, the simple life cycle is an example of a direct development. So direct development basically says just that. We develop to the adult stage from a fertilized egg without a larval stage. As you'll see, the larval stage is a stage that's very different from our adult. It looks different. It functions different. So humans, good example of a direct development. Right, little kids that are running around, they generally look like adults. They might not act like them, but who says that all adults act like adults either, so, right? <laughs> That's direct development, best way that we can have. Complex life cycles have this larval stage inside of it. And that means that as we develop to the adult, we're going to go egg to a larval stage to an adult. And in order to get to that adult, then we're going to have to have a pretty big change in our body plan. Because our larval stage is different. It looks different. So in our indirect development, I believe this is from our textbook, you can talk about butterflies and moths. You have a caterpillar. That's our larval stage. It looks nothing like the adult looks absolutely nothing like the adult. That's a form of complex life cycle. Now, with these complex life cycles, we can start to include resting stages in there. So in our butter butterflies, our resting stage is usually this, the cocoon, your chrysalis. In some cases, it's the egg is actually the resting stage. You get to the chrysalis, and it's very short-lived. These life cycles could also include a change in gender, change in sex. I, I'd say gender because sex is more genetic. So you're genetically, it says that you're male, but then there's a signal out there and all of a sudden you become female. Or it, vice versa, you're genetically female and then all of a sudden you transition to male. And it's functional, functional transition. So where, where have we seen that? Any, any movie buffs or avid readers? 
Jurassic Park did that. <laughs> yeah, and it's rooted. It, it's it's it does have. I, I don't. Who knows if the dinosaurs do that? But yeah, we have some some reptiles that can sense and change. We talked about turtles, right? Sex determination. Where genetically they're male, but depending on on the environment, they either stay male or, or they develop as a female, or vice versa. All right, so that's that's kind of development at the egg stage. This could also be as an adult. So some fish will also do this. They're all male, all right? They're all male. You have a chance of reproducing, and then once you get to a certain size, once you get large enough, now it's it's time to switch transition to a female because the cost of reproduction is more. So these complex life cycles exhibit this metamorphic development. That's what it is. In order to get from our larval stage to the adult, we're going to undergo metamorphosis. And metamorphic development is simply the developmental pattern that includes a larval stage. And we've defined our larval stage as being different from our adult. And it's going to be radically different. Get this? Plants and algae are a little bit different because they can have this alternation of generations where you can alternate between your diploid stage and your haploid stage. So one set of growth is haploid, another form of growth is diploid. So in our plants and algae, all right, you can see this, the gametophytes are typically haploid stages. And then the gametophytes would fuse to form our zygotes that ultimately develop our sporophytes. And the sporophytes, that's our diploid form, and they'll produce the spores through a process called meiosis, right, which is the halving of our genetic code. So now our spores are haploid form. Our life cycle, the full life cycle, is when we look at the full cycle. So if we go from a gametophyte all around back to a gametophyte, that could represent a life cycle. Or a sporophyte around to a sporophyte, that could be a life cycle. And which one, which one where do we start, where do we define the dominant stage, just kind of depends on, on the organism that we're looking at. Botany's been talking about this, right? Your club fungus, club mosses, right? should have been talking about all of those. Your ferns, should be talking about those. So, uh, definitely what we're talking about is our gametophytes and our sporophytes have these distinct life forms. And that's different. It's different from, from animals. Some of our protozoan parasites do this. Protozoans in general where we've got haploid stage and a very brief diploid stage before it transitions back to haploid, whereas others are almost all diploids, and it's just the gametes are the haploid stages. Alternation of generations. All right. I threw in plants just for you plant people. Talk about metamorphosis. Because metamorphosis I'm not going to say it's rare, it's there, it's out there. There are some organisms that you would be quite surprised at that exhibit metamorphosis. So when we have metamorphosis, we're usually talking about a pretty drastic change in our body plan. And that's a change between our larval stage and the adult stage. When we have this change, we change the ecological interactions that are taking place. So you can think of it as a larval stage is adapted for one set of in ecological interactions. And then we have this complete transition that moves our adult into a separate set of interactions. That could be advantageous. Could be advantageous to do that. But in order to get the advantages, we're going to, this will come with disadvantages. So we're going to start with the disadvantages first. So first, we're going to undergo this radical change in our body plan we're going to spend energy. 
we're going to spend a lot of energy. Because it's not just changing our body plan, but we also have to upkeep the regulatory system, the genetic code for both sets. For direct development, you have the plan for the adult. That's it. You've got all the genetic code that says this is how we build this individual. But with organisms that undergo metamorphosis, you have to have the genetic code that says this is how you build the larval stage. And then you have to have the genetic code that says this is how you build the adult stage. And then you have that genetic code in between that says this is how we do the transition. So when it comes to energetically, yeah, the energetic cost, it's not just upkeep of our genetic code and the regulatory system. It's also the spending the energy for the change in the body plan, for that rapid change in growth. The second major disadvantage is that we often see an increased risk of mortality, especially when we are transitioning between the larval stage and the adult stage. Why is that? Why do we tend to have higher mortality rates? Because they're stuck in one place. Exactly. We're not moving. If a predator comes overhead, your chrysalis can't get up and move and hide. It's there. Your mosquitoes, the larval stage, they pupate. They're stuck on the top of the water. If a fish comes swimming around, those things aren't going to be diving down like the larval stages. And you can, you can observe it. Uh, actually, sometimes you can see the mosquito larvae in uh, the tanks in my lab. I try to kill them pretty quickly because I don't like the mosquitoes. But they're going to be, those wigglers, as they're called, are in the water column. If you disturb it, they tend to dive. They tend to dive down to try to avoid uh, predator. They can't do that as a pupil stage. So your lack of movement makes you at higher risk of, of being consumed. All right, so these are pretty big costs. But we know metamorphosis exists. And if it exists, what does that mean? It means our benefits well exceed these costs. So benefits of this. Exploitation of different habitats. That goes to the idea of the ecological interactions. Our larval body plan is completely different than our adult body plan. That means that we can utilize or we can exploit different habitats. And when we exploit different habitats, one, it's going to limit competition between our, our larval stages and the adults, so we're not competing with each other. And number two, sometimes we can now capitalize on those habitats that are very short-lived. We said ephemeral which is temporary and so forth. A lot of these temporal ponds, temporal habitats, are very productive. They have a lot of nutrients in there, a lot of food supply. So we can think about different organisms that do this. Right? Easiest, the, the one that I think, are amphibians, frogs, salamanders, newts, larval stages out in aquatic habitat. If our, our, our frogs capitalize on the temporary ponds that form after the spring rains, well, those tend to be highly nutritious. You have all of, during that drying period, once it dried out, you have a lot of decomposition that can occur. Abundant oxygen that's going to break down all the nutrients, all the organic material that, that used to be at the bottom of the pond. And now, all of a sudden, once we fill up that basin, you've released all those nutrients now that's available for algae and plants to grow, provide a food source for our tadpoles. And then as the pond starts to dry up, tadpoles just metamorphose, get out of there, they, they leave. That's great for them. They get all that energy, and then they transition when their habitat ends. And all of those larval stages, they're in the pond. They're not competing for the same food supply as the adults. So we've minimized competition with our, within our own life cycle. All right, so we can exploit different habitats. That's a big benefit. Second benefit is that we can utilize the specialized body plans for certain goals. And we've got two different aspects. So our larval stage could be the 
predominant dispersal stage, in which case we're going to have a plan that benefits movement, that gets us out there, gets us to hopefully find a new habitat, a new hopefully productive habitat. Or we can have a larval stage that specializes in, let's say, food acquisition, nutrient acquisition. So our two examples here are, are mayflies and coral. So mayflies are aquatic insects, right? Uh, Bioblitz, Tribeta Bioblitz was at Knickerbocker Ranch, right? Right? Who went? Did anybody go? Some, I know some people here. I think it was at Knickerbocker Ranch. Were the mayflies out? Were there a lot of them? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, mammalogy too. That was the other the other course that goes out there. Uh, so mayflies, larval stage is in is in the aquatic system. All right, they're there. The larval stages, depending on on the species, depending on where we're at, it's one to two years. Larval stage lives in that 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 stream, feeding on that stream. That's basically what the larval stages are doing. They're feeding and growing, and then as soon as they metamorphose into the adult, then it becomes reproductive stage only. And your mayflies, they only live maybe a day. They basically go out, mate, and die. Did you get one? You're in entomology, aren't you, Logan? Did you get a mayfly? You did. See? See? They don't stage. That's a reproductive stage. If that's its own goal, just to get out and reproduce, you don't have to do a whole lot. You don't have to try to feed, you don't have to have uh, adaptations that allow you to feed, you really don't even need a whole lot of adaptations that allow you to avoid predation because you're only going to be around for maybe 24 hours. So mayflies represent one type of strategy. Utilize the larval stage as a feeding strategy. Coral represents the opposite. Now our larval stage, what we have, Our larval stages are the primary dispersal stages, and then our adult stage represents the growth and reproduction. So our larval stages then are very small. They utilize water, the, the water currents to disperse, uh, and they hope that your gametes, whoops, gametes can actually meet up out in the water column, and that when they do form the gamete and they do start to settle onto a substrate, that they settle in a spot that is uh, suitable for their life. So our larval stage for the coral is dispersal, and our growth and reproduction all with the adult. So we've separated these two different types of, of uh, functions and have specialized plans, body plans, to accomplish that function. All right. So metamorphosis... Morphosis is going to take place. Our benefits have to exceed the cost, and we know since it exists in so many organisms, benefits do. There is a reason why, we, why they still persist. These life cycle stages can also have resting stages inside of them, or the life cycles, uh, these complex life cycles. I'm going to say see previous lectures for additional information because we talked about re resting stages um, in response to harsh conditions. And we talked about how it's an avoidance mechanism. If we're going to utilize it as an avoidance mechanism, it's usually built into our, one of the developmental st stages or developmental cycles. So maybe it's just before you become the larvae, or maybe it's between the larval and the adult stage. What we do know is that if it's... If organism is going to use these resting stages as an avoidance strategy, that stage, when it occurs, corresponds uh, with our harsh conditions. So even here around Texas, we have moth species that pupate over the winter. They survive the winter as a, in their little cocoon. And then in the spring, they come out and mate. 
Other moths, they, they pupate in the spring, or they actually, the larval stages emerge or hatch from the eggs in the spring, they grow, and then they, they get to adulthood within just that spring to fall time period. The two different strategies. But both of our resting stages, either the egg or the pupa, corresponds to your period of harsh conditions. We also have, I believe, some other, uh, other moths that pupate over the heat of the summer, too. Is that right? Do you have, Logan, do you have entomology, too? You only got it, too. Yeah. So I believe some of them also pupate over the summer at the, the driest time of the year. So, again, normally we're going to see it synchronized to periods of harsh conditions. All right. Change in sex. Let's, uh, before we get to this, let's uh, do our quiz, our attendance quiz. So our attendance quiz, there's five answer choices. We have two answers. Two answers, red and blue. Red and blue. Red and blue. Red and Right. Ready? No. Change in sex. So simple life cycles. Sex is uh, determined early in our development, remains constant. <coughs> but in our complex life cycles, we have the opportunity to change change our sex, change our, our functional And we usually see it as sequential hermaphroditism, where you start out as one sex, and then you transition to another sex later on. And again, these are functional. So if we're going to see this, we're going to know that sex changes during the lifespan. What causes that could be due to conditions. And it might not just be once, one time. It could be multiple times. Or they flip back and forth based on the conditions. So we, we talked about Jack in the pulpit. Right? That's the plant that's out in the forest, forest floor. Whether or not it produces male versus female flowers depends on the environmental conditions, the resources. Since we know the female flowers are more energetically costly, it makes more sense to only produce those flowers when you end up finding a light gap or if you end up germinating in a light gap, right? And then even on a same, the same plant itself, the side that tends to be warmer might produce or the more southern facing or gets more sun. That might actually be uh, more female flowers, uh, whereas the opposite side of that plant may be more male flowers, all on one, all right? So if it's gonna be based on conditions, then typically the more costly sex would be produced 
when conditions are favorable. But we could have a, it could be developmentally programmed to actually have this change of sex if, it, if we receive the appropriate triggers or the appropriate cue. And this type of pattern, this type of, of sex change could be adapted and, and selection could favor it if our reproductive success is dependent on certain factors that change as we age. So for example, if our reproductive success is correlated to our age or size, then what we may do is be one sex, develop as one type of sex early in life, and we're going to take the sex that is less costly energetically or have a lower reproductive success rate, which is usually males. And then once you get to a certain age or size, then transition to the female to try to maximize your success when you do reproduce. Since the female sex tends to be more energetically costly and it's, it's tied to fitness, tied to fitness. So a male can, can mate with you know, 100 females but the female mates once, and then they produce the offspring, and they tend to be more invested in the development of those offspring. So we could see either protandrous or uh, protogenous type of development that occurs. So protandrous is when an individual is first male and then transitions to a female. Protogenous is when we're first female and then transition to the male. Classic example. Example is clownfish. They are protandrous. So our individuals develop first as, as males. Gives them the opportunity. They might not be super successful at mating, right? but at least they have a chance of mating two, three, four, maybe a hundred different times. And maybe succeed once to produce a bunch of offspring. They don't transition to female until they get to be older and bigger in size. At that point, if you're bigger in size, you can produce more eggs, produce more offspring at that, at that, at that size. So it benefits you to, to make that switch. Other fish do the same thing. They can actually sense you may ha only have a few females, or actually may start out as having mostly females. And then once the density of males gets below a certain threshold, they sense that some of the females aren't having them, aren't, they're not being mated with. So then all of a sudden you'll have a couple of them transition to males, which now start to mate with the females, the rest of the females. And in those types of systems, usually the mating success of males depends on their territory, holding their territory acquisition and holding ability. So for that, you want to be a bigger fish. You want to be more aggressive. And if you're bigger and more aggressive, you're going to get more mates and so forth. So yeah, clownfish are a good example. You're going to find a lot of different examples out there of this type of developmental pattern. And it's tied to reproductive success. All right, summary of our life cycles. We can be simple or complex. And the evolution of these, these types of life cycles depends on a lot of things. It depends on, on a lot of different things. What, what types of environments are we in? What's the environmental variability like? What's our co competition going to be like between larval stages and adults? Right. There are costs to metamorphosis. It's very energetically expensive. You have higher mortality rates during our transition, but we could take advantage of exploitation of, of different habitats, right. exploitation of different habitats, and we could take advantage of specialized functions, specialized body plans. With these complex life cycles, we can also build in our, our resting stages. So we have the possibility of surviving harsh conditions by just avoiding it as a resting stage. Wait it out, basically shut down, become a stage that resists any of those harsh conditions.
flew through that. I'll let you get that copied. Get it? All right. And then sex. Simple life cycles is genetically determined, but in our meta, in our uh, complex life cycles, we do have the possibility of switching our functional sex. And this is definitely going to be adaptive if reproductive success varies with age or size or resource acquisition or even the social system. We still have our costs. Right? It's part of our complex life cycles. We're going to have to maintain genetic code that says this is how you function as a male, this is how you function as a female individual, and all of the code that, that handles the regulation, you know, turning the genes on and off so that we do develop and function as one sex and then switch to the other sex. But again, those costs are going to be exceeded by the benefits. Right. All right. So uh, this quiz, so we just basically covered up our life, our life, life cycles. Uh, Friday we're going to do life, life spans. Quiz for life cycles up. You've got until Friday, end of the end of the evening, eleven thirty at night to take it. Um, I do have a video. So fish actually undergo metamorphosis. And a lot of people, I think, are surprised by that. They don't really think of fish as undergoing metamorphosis. This is a flatfish. This is the development. I think you're going to notice it. But notice how the body plan starts to change as they grow and develop. We're almost there. Wait for it. Note that eye. Look at that. Not quite done. Do that again. This is metamorphosis. And it's not just like, yeah, baby proportions are off. But we're not undergoing changes in skeletal structure. I mean, you're seeing changes in skeletal structure as this is developing. You're getting movement, elongation, shrinkage in different places. You can see it in the skull. You can see it in the mouth. You're seeing the eyes. The eyes have to flip. So the eyes of the larval stage are on both sides of the head of the flatfish. But as the flatfish develops, that eye, that one eye, has to get moved over to the top. Why? Because these things lay flat on the ground. So uh, this is tight. This is this is development, metamorphosis, and it's pretty cool that it's time lapsed. All right. So we're gonna stop here. Oh, man, look at that. It's crazy. You see, mouth moves, gets bits, gets bigger. I mean, it's crazy. All right, so yeah, that's our that's our life cycle. Uh, we're gonna do lifespan next. I do believe lifespan. Uh, we'll we'll get we'll talk about that all through Friday. Uh, our exam will stop at the lifespan. All right. So we'll go through the lifespan, and then next week we'll we'll talk about. Um, the other part, life cycle, lifespan, and reproduction. We'll talk about some of the reproductive strategies next week. All right. Start reviewing. Don't forget about the quiz. Friday, 1130.
And we also have a quiz that's due tomorrow. What's that? And today? Was it today? Maybe it's it's today, not not tomorrow. Oh yeah, because we did two. Today and tomorrow. So, yeah, so the VX curves and stuff, that end of the summary that we just we started, or I reviewed that summary slide today. Yeah, that's due tomorrow. Yep. All right. See you Friday.